But you see, God is so much more real, as many of you will know in your own experience. When you have to seek and you have to wrestle and you have to fight your way through to Him, when you do meet with Him, He's so much more real. Your greatness we proclaim We stand as one in giving you All glory and acclaim To you our hearts are open And to you our hands we raise Take the place of honor in our life. Emmanuel, our God is with us. Prince of peace, mighty. do bad things happen to good people? Is our trust in God enough to get us through tough times? Today's message is called, God Speaks Out of the Storm. If you got your Bible, I'm going to read this morning from Job chapter 38, the book of Job. And for those who have not been part of the recent Sunday mornings, We have been looking into this book, and the story is that Job unexpectedly fell into very hard times, losing his 
wealth, his business, his family, his health. And then some friends came to comfort him in his distress. And these friends assumed two possible explanations for what had gone on in Job's experience. Either Job was being unfaithful to God, and these were the consequences, or God was being unfaithful to Job and was not fulfilling what they believed to be the obligations God had towards him. And Job believed these two options too, but his friends concluded that it was Job was guilty of sin, and they kept telling him that, think harder, Job, there are sins that you're not acknowledging, these are the reasons why things have gone wrong in your life. And Job concludes that it was God who was being unfaithful to him, because he knew he was not guilty of any hidden sin that might bring about this kind of consequence as a result. Now, in past weeks, we've listened to Eliphaz talk, we've listened to Bildad talk, we've listened to Zophar, those are the three friends, and then a fourth friend came on the scene, a younger man called Elihu, we listened to him last time, we've listened a little bit to Job in between all of these, but now after 37 chapters of silence on the part of God, God speaks. And I want to read you a little bit of what God says, and we'll talk about uh, this. It's four chapters altogether. I'm not going to read all that, of course. But in chapter 38 and verse 1, it says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched the measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. And it goes on in similar vein. Let me pick it up in verse 31. Can you bind the beautiful Pleiades? Can you loose the cords of Orion? Can you bring about the constellations in their seasons or lead the bear out with its cubs? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion? over the earth, and down to verse 36, who endowed the heart with wisdom or gave understanding to the mind? And then over to chapter 40, when God speaks a second time, verse 6, the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm, brace yourself like a man, I will question you and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? That's as far as I'm going to read. Earlier in the book, Job has challenged God to speak to him and to answer him on 36 separate occasions. One example in chapter 31, verse 35, Oh, that I had someone to hear me. I sign now my defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser put his indictment in writing. God, in the silence of this agony, with all this advice I am being given, which only heaps upon me a sense of guilt, God, speak to me. Say something. 36 times. Job cries out in that vein. And now after 37 chapters of silence from God, God speaks to him. And basically, when God speaks to him, he gives to Job his autobiography. 
I think this is the closest you get to an autobiography by God in the whole of Scripture. And it is remarkable both for what he does say, but also it's remarkable for what he does not say in these chapters. He says nothing at all about the issues that have dominated the first 37 chapters of the book. He says nothing about Job's suffering. That's been the main issue. He said nothing about Satan's involvement back in the first two chapters. You remember that Satan and God set up a battlefield in the soul of Job. He says nothing about that. He says nothing about the accusations of the four friends that came with their mixture of truth and half-truths and complete falsehoods against Job. Only at the end of the book does he address the friends with one verse. In chapter 42, verse 7, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Tenemite, I am angry with you and your two friends, but you've not spoken to me of what is right. But apart from that, he says nothing about the details that these friends raised up. He just sweepingly says, what you've said is not right. Now, God makes two speeches with a short three-verse reply from Job in the middle, in which basically Job says, I have nothing to say, I have nothing to say, when God speaks to him. But I want you to notice an important thing. Each time it says that God spoke to Job out of the storm, in chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job, out of the storm. It's repeated in chapter 40, verse 6. The second time God begins to speak, then the Lord answered Job, out of the storm. Let me just first, before we look at what God said, suggest three things about the silence of God. Number one, the silence of God does not indicate the absence of God. That's a fear sometimes when God seems silent, he doesn't seem to do anything. We fear he is absent, but here he speaks out of the storm, not above the storm, not from behind the storm, not over the storm. But God has actually been in the storm. The storm is the turmoil of Job's life and experience. He'd been present all along. When you and I find times when we wish God would intervene, we wish God would speak, don't let your default instinct be to assume he's absent. The second thing I would say is that the silence of God does not indicate the injustice of God, the fact he's not correcting things that are wrong. He's not writing injustice because when he speaks to him the second time in chapter 40 and verse 8, he says, would you discredit my justice? Well, Job had a lot of reasons in his own thinking as to why he would discredit the justice of God. He says, do you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? In other words, weighing in the balance, are you more just than I am in your perspective over against my perspective, Job? You know, the character of God demands that we assume his justice. He is just, that is his very nature. But it is under threat sometimes. We look around and why everybody else seems to be doing well and I'm not. And why does other people not have this issue? Yet I'm battling with it. And why does he have one little issue? I have 10 big issues that are impinging on my life and my freedom. Is God being just? Well, his silence does not indicate the injustice of God. And thirdly, God's silence does not indicate the neglect of God. Sometimes we fear, well, I'm just not significant enough, and he is neglecting me. May not be absent, but I'm not important. You know, waiting for God can be a healthy thing. God is never in a hurry. 
The Bible, I think, makes that very clear. And there's a great verse in Isaiah 5 and verse 19 that says, Woe to those who say, let God hurry. Let him hasten his work so we may see it. Let it approach. Let the plan of the Holy One of Israel come so that we may know it. Now he says, woe to those who say that. Let God hurry. I want to see what he's doing. We're sometimes asking for a privilege that's not always given to us. We do not always know what God is doing, but it does not mean he has neglected us. And here's the positive thing from that. God's silences and God's delays stop us from taking him for granted. It drives us to seek him. It drives us to ask. It drives us to knock. If everything happened on our agenda, to our liking, we would stop seeking, stop asking, stop knocking, stop dealing with God. We would just float in the river of everything that was going so well and so easily. There are two sayings I want to put together. One saying is, absence makes the heart grow fonder. And the other is, familiarity breeds contempt. Both those things can be true of God. When God seems absent, it actually does awaken in us a hunger and a thirst and a longing for him. It makes the heart grow fonder. Familiarity breeds contempt. We don't really care because we have no struggle. You know, food is so much nicer when you're hungry. Water is so much more refreshing when you're thirsty. Someone has very kindly put a glass of water here on this table. And uh, it's cold, I can tell by the feel of the glass. It's, it's lovely, fresh, cold water. And it will probably stay there the whole of the service because I'm not thirsty. If I was thirsty... I would drink. In fact, talking about this made me feel a bit thirsty. So, <laughs> it's called water suggestion, I think. But you see, God is so much more real, as many of you will know in your own experience, when you have to seek and you have to wrestle and you have to fight your way through to him. When you do meet with him, he's so much more real. And so God has kept himself silent and has kept himself apparently distant from Job during all these chapters. Yet awakened in Job's heart. We'll look at Job in our last message from this book next week, Job himself. And there is an awakening of a longing to find and meet with and hear from God. Now when God speaks... He asks Job some questions. He says to him, uh, verse 3, Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. And if I've counted correctly, God then asks Job 68 questions. Job had asked God 36 questions. Now God almost doubles it, asking him 68 questions. So I have 68 points this morning. No, I don't. We will generalize. (laughs) But talk about being intimidated. 68 questions, God says, tell me, what about this? What about that? What about this? What about the other? Job, think about what I'm asking you. Job doesn't reply, and when he does reply, he says, I have nothing to say. But asking questions is a great way to teach. It makes us think. Job asks questions, and God remains silent in the first part. Now God asks questions, and Job remains silent. But the questions make us think. That's what they're designed to do. It's a great way to teach. A man asked a Jewish rabbi on one occasion why rabbis always seem to answer every question with another question. And the rabbi said, why not? (laughs) Well, let me 
survey the questions of God with you. First of all, the first speech which comes out of the storm in chapter 38 to chapter 40 in verse 2. And he asks questions of Job, and you can read through this on your own sometime. He asks Job questions that drive his attention to the bigness of God. And then he asks him questions that drive Job's attention to the finite details of God's creation. In other words, he takes out a telescope. A telescope, of course, brings distant things close. And he asks Job questions about what you might see through the telescope. And then he brings out a microscope. And he asks Job things that you might see through a microscope. A microscope makes close things larger. I want to point out five things in this first speech. He talks about the creation of the world, first of all, in verse 4. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched the measuring line across it? And so on. Were you involved, Job, in the creation of the world? Now, of course you weren't. But when you know how to create something out of nothing then you might begin to understand me, is the implication God makes here. And if you can't create something out of nothing, don't question the abilities and the capacities I have, which is so outside of your own range. Then he looks up into the sky and talks about the creation of the universe. In verse 31, Can you bind the beautiful Pleiades? Can you loose the court of Orion? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or lead out the bear with its cubs? Are you capable, Job, of creating these constellations that are in the night sky? Pleiades is a star cluster that is visible to the naked eye. We sometimes call it the Seven Sisters. It is 444.2 light years away from Earth. That makes it a close neighbor in galactic terms. 444 light years away from Earth. Orion, which is another constellation that God mentions specifically, it's three times as far away. Orion is 1,344 light years away from Earth. Then he mentions the bear. That's in the Ursa Major constellation. You've got the great bear and the little bear. He implies both when he says, talks about the bear with its cub, the great bear and little bear. That's much, much closer. The stars that make up the bear range from 65 light years away to 210 light years away. They identified these skies back in the days of Job already. And he says, look at the vastness of the sky. Job didn't know how many light years, of course, they were away from Earth. He didn't know anything about light years. But Job, could you, could you put this together? On a clear, moonless night, we can only see less than 5,000 stars in the sky. In both hemispheres, north and south, combined together, it is less than 10,000 stars that are visible to the naked eye. And these are all within relatively near proximity within our Milky Way galaxy. If you know where to look, you can see one light outside of our galaxy. And it is the, uh, it is Andromeda, which is a galaxy of its own, 2.2 million light years away. 
The first time I saw Andromeda through a telescope, I could hardly sleep. In fact, I didn't sleep that night. Just excited. You can just see the spiral shape. 2.2 million light years away, and it's bigger than our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Astronomers estimate there are 400 billion stars in our galaxy. We can see 5,000. 400 billion stars in our galaxy. And they estimate there are between 100 to 200 billion galaxies in the universe. And that is an estimate based on our observable universe. And the big question being dealt with is, are there more universes? And the speculation is that there are billions of universes. Scientists tell us, on the basis of what they have measured and the continuing rate of the universe's expansion, that we can estimate that the universe is at least 92 billion light years in diameter. Now, those figures mean nothing, of course. Uh, light travels at 300,000 kilometers a second. That means it will go around the Earth seven and a half times in a second. And we live in a 92 billion light year diameter universe. And we know those details, Job didn't, but he is saying to Job, can you bring forth these constellations? So vast and so distant, 444 light years away, Pleiades, 1,344 light years away, Orion. Makes us feel very small, doesn't it? Makes God seem very big, doesn't it? It was Plato in the fourth century who wrote, astronomy compels the soul to look upward and leads us from this world to an altogether another one. So Job, do you think there's some possibility that I'm incapable when you look at all of that? Then he talks about the creation of scientific laws in verse 33. Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? I mean, how do we know how to figure out the distances I have just quoted? Because there are universal laws that govern our universe that make it work the way it works. And all those laws are under the dominion of God. And God says to him, um, what, what about the laws of the heavens? Job. Then he talks about the creation of the human mind in verse 36, who endowed the heart of wisdom and gave understanding to the mind. If you can calculate stars and the universe on the basis of laws that God has made, how do you have the ability to even think these thoughts in the first place? It's because I create you with a mind. I gave your mind intelligence that you might know. I gave your heart wisdom that you might understand, says God. And then if the universe is too big and it's too far and it's too distant, he then says, okay, Job, let's look right under your nose. And he brings them right down into the animal world. And you can read in chapter 39 a whole variety of animals he talks about. End of chapter 38, he, he mentions the lion and the lioness. Who gives him food, he asks. He talks about the ravens. Who provides the ravens with food? Then he talks about mountain goats. He talks about their conception, their gestation, and their birth. How do you think that works for mountain goat, Job? And then he talks about wild donkeys. They're self-sufficient. They laugh at the commotions that upset us. They're not worried. They roam the hills, searching for any green thing, he says. And he talks about the wild ox has a mind of its own. You don't trust a wild ox to take a straight plow or to bring 
grain home from the field, not of its wild, you don't. You talk about an ostrich who's not been endowed with wisdom and good sense. It lays her eggs on the ground, and mindful that a foot may crush them. An ostrich treats her young harshly, and she could not care less if it's all in vain. That's the ostrich. And then he says, what about the horse? And his strength, his ability to leap, his speed, or the hawk that migrates from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere every year, or the eagle that soars so high and has such brilliant eyesight it can dive and catch uh, its food just like that. And all of these are governed by a remarkable instinct and ability. And we haven't read them. He takes a whole chapter just to give a little zoology lesson to Job. Now, why does God give lessons in cosmology, in anthropology, in biology, in zoology, in ornithology, in archaeology, in psychology, in theology, with no apology? <laughs> <laughs> why does he do this in all these chapters? I suggest he's teaching two things. Job, here's the first thing. When God seems distant, remember the things that you do know, first of all. And secondly, remember the things that you don't know. So first, remember the things that you do know. In the light of what God has said, he is saying, remember, Job, you don't understand. I seem to have been silent. You have no idea what's going on in your life, but remember the competence of your creator. And it's written every night in the sky. Paul tells us that when he says in Romans 1.20, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. There's a paradox in that verse, if you notice carefully, God's invisible qualities have been clearly seen. Have the invisible qualities of God been clearly seen in his creation? You see his fingerprints all over the place. I believe it was President Franklin Roosevelt, though I may have the president wrong. I couldn't find a source for this, but I know this is true. One of the fairly recent presidents, I think it was Roosevelt, who on a clear night would go outside and sit on a chair and look up into the far corners of the night and spend time there. And then would come back in the house and say, that puts everything into perspective. And you begin to see our little issues on our cosmic scale, our little issues. David wrote in Psalm 8, verse 3, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, what you have set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man, you care for him. And God is silent. Remember what you already know. You might ask, what is man? But let's, before you say that, say, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, It's not just his creative power we need to remind ourselves of, but his sustaining power as well. God not just set it all in motion, he sustains it. So remember, when you're confused, what you do know about God. That's the first implication of what God said to him. And secondly, remember, there are things you don't know. There are mysteries that we are not invited to look into or to become part of. Deuteronomy 29, 29 is a great verse. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. 
If it's revealed, it belongs to us. That doesn't mean we know it all yet. If it's been revealed, we have to pursue and seek for things that have been revealed but not yet known maybe to us personally. But there are things that are revealed that are for us. But there are things which are not revealed. And what this verse says is, mind your own business when it comes to those things. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. It's the things that are revealed that belongs to us. Later in Job 42, verse 3, Job says, Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. There are things that we do not understand. There are things too wonderful for us to know. And Job now acknowledges there are things he could not know and did not know. There are questions that do not have an answer. David, very wisely, in Psalm 131, wrote, I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. If I know my limitations. And sometimes we need the humility to simply stand back from a situation and say, I don't know. John Stott has written, it is as important we say I don't know about the things that are not revealed as it is to say I do know about the things that are. Elihu, who in my view comes closest to the truth of the four men who try to help Job, he says in Job 36, 26, how great is God beyond our understanding The number of his years is past finding out. There are limits to what we can know. He is past uh, understanding. Who am I to criticize a brain surgeon in his area of expertise? I know nothing about brain surgery. Who am I to criticize a rocket scientist in his area of expertise? I know nothing about rocket science. Who am I to criticize God in his area of expertise being God? I know nothing about being God. It's like asking a dog to explain its master. Asking a cat to explain why its human owner is out of the house all day and to be able to tell you exactly what they're doing when they've gone. No cat has that capacity. No dog has that capacity. No human has the capacity to know other than what God has revealed. about his greatness. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. Of course, we pursue those things which have been revealed and we grow in our knowledge of those. But don't invent what God has not revealed. That's what the three friends, along with Elihu, did for Job. They invented ideas that seemed logical to them. God finishes this first speech with a challenge to Job's impertinence. He says to him, will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. And Job says, verse 3 of chapter 4, Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once. I have no answer. Twice I will say no more. That's Job's answer. He's stumped. Then God speaks a second time very quickly. This won't take long. He speaks a second time out of the storm. In chapter 40, verse 6, he begins, and this is built around two bizarre illustrations that God gives to show his greatness. Illustrations that were right under Job's nose, I guess, And he talks about two animals. One he calls the behemoth, and he takes 10 verses to talk about the behemoth, and the other he calls the leviathan, and he spends 34 verses talking about the leviathan. Now, the behemoth is most likely the hippopotamus that he's describing. It could be an elephant, but most likely the hippopotamus. The leviathan is almost certainly a crocodile. And if you read it and think of a crocodile, it'll read 
accurately. And so in 44 verses altogether, you combine them, he is saying to Job, you don't have the wisdom to understand either. So how do you expect to have the wisdom to understand the universe and the God who lies behind it? He describes the hippopotamus as being of great strength. He is king of the river. He's not scared when the river rages. He has a great reputation in the animal world, and he's difficult to capture. That's a summary of what he says about it. He says about the crocodile, he's also hard to capture. You cannot tame a crocodile. You can't make him a pet. He has awesome teeth. It's hard to penetrate his skin with spears. He terrifies everything around him, and there's nothing that's equal to him. That's the summary of what he says in chapter uh, 41. Both these animals are extremely dangerous and powerful. Here's an interesting bit of information. I, I didn't know it. I did a bit of a search on the internet. Hippopotamus are the most dangerous animal in the world. They kill more human beings than any other animal. Did you know that? That's the hippo. They kill up to 3,000 people every year. The second most dangerous animal in the world is the crocodile. They kill something like 1,500, 2,000 people every year. So he picks the two most dangerous animals in the world, the hippo and the croc. That doesn't include, of course, reptiles and insects who are really the bigger killers. The mosquito is the biggest living killer in the world after the human being. Human being is the biggest killer. Mosquitoes kill about three quarters of a million people every year, mainly through malaria, of course. Snakes kill about 50,000 people every year. Jellyfish kill thousands. Scorpions kill more than hippos or crocs. But in the actual animal mammal world, these are the biggest killers. They're surrounded by mystery. They're strong, they're tough, you can't tame them. And God spends 44 verses talking about them and basically says, if I would make such unpredictable animals, such seemingly useless animals, such dangerous animals. Would you make those, Job? I don't think so. Don't think, then, that you understand my ways. That brings the debate to an end. It's, it's a bit anticlimactic that the whole debate between that's gone on through this book ends with a hippopotamus and a crocodile. <laughs> but what the message is, is there's no simple answer to this whole question of silence from God and all the traumas that went on during that silence. There's no satisfactory answer. And one of the main conclusions of the book is that we cannot always understand the ways of God. He does not always reveal them, and we have to get used to that. Get used to it. Know it. That we do sometimes walk in the darkness. Or as 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 says, we live by faith, not by sight, though we prefer to live by sight. I'm going to finish with the words of a hymn that some of you may know. Words of these, tempted and tried, were oft made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long, while there are others living about us, never molested, though in the wrong. Farther along, we'll know all about it. Farther along, we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother. Live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. Tempted and tried, how often we question. Why we must suffer year after year, being accused by those of our loved ones, 
even though we've walked in God's holy fear. But further along, we'll know all about it. Further along, we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother. Live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. One day, I am sure that we will. In the meantime, we have to live without explanations in some of the most difficult areas of life. Thank you.